if we have not been introduced, I am Heather Hall. Um, I was laureled, uh, <laughs> I believe, for uh, the plan cards that I have reconstructed over the years. Uh, and at this point, I've done over two dozen packs of cards, um, all of them 1650 and older. So there's a couple that are a little post SCA period, but um, so what? I, I am going to show you a lot of modern packs, not um they are relevant to the story either way folks are like well when did this come into play and it's like well it came into play post period so we will talk about those elements as well um if that makes any sense uh i i hope uh you all could find my handout it's a little outdated at this point but then again it's not because this is a sca stuff you know um shall i proceed <laughs> Is it possible you can put a uh, link to the handout somewhere? Because I couldn't find it. Oh, oh, um, all right. I'll, I'll, I, I will get that done sometime in the, in the not too distant. I'll do that sometime in the hour. I, can you help me get a link on here? I'm a little, I'm so not savvy with Zoom. Yeah, you're going to see okay. if you've got the participants window down at the bottom where there's yeah. a chat you're going to see a thing that looks like a page there's a you see now why doesn't it just give you this if you chat? click on that it'll let you pull a file from wherever you want to pull it on your computer or whatever and just post it right in the chat i just okay. put a link in the chat and the that's for all the rum handouts heathers is already there okay you're awesome thank you appreciate it thank, thank you, you so ever much. so much thank you thank you you're thank you Okay, um, and like I said, I, I very much bullet point my handouts because I, depending on what questions and what mood I'm in, I guess, uh, my, my conversation can kind of go all over the place. This is a, con this is a, a topic that could, I could really teach a three hour class. Uh, and I still don't really know anything about playing cards. <laughs> There's just so much. Uh, oh my gosh. The, the nice thing about wearing PPE is that you know, nobody can tell that I broke a tooth, but now you can <laughs> see that. Anyway, um, so I'm going to start with an ordinary pack of playing cards. This is a, a, I, I, a lot of people call these bikes. Uh, I'm going to refer this, to this, or I'm going to attempt to refer to this as a poker pack. Uh, deck is rather American to use. Um, but it is not inappropriate, and the more I see uh, playing modern playing card forms, the more I see deck used anyway. So don't worry. I'm sorry. Oh, um, anyway, so you know what these look like. Um, these are, and I'm a lefty. <laughs> there we go. These are modern poker cards. They are two and a half by three and a half inches. Um, they are in inches because they are English. I knew you were going to call me. My neighbor is calling me right now. <laughs> um, they are there because uh, poker cards are developed in the United States and they are the United States as colonies. They're going to be in English measurements. Everything else I try to make sure is in uh, metric. I try to put them in millimeters, um, but these are appropriately going to be English. Uh, but who are these characters anyway, and why are they there? Uh, who the heck hasn't done this? Who hasn't seen these and go, where does this come from? There are some uh, rumors, myths, stories that go about uh, a lot of them are not true. Some of them come from uh, the Soldier's Almanac, for example. Uh, and although I would I would say that is relevant to history because the Soldier's Almanac is a you know a little bullet point in history there by itself, it it's not the accurate history of playing cards themselves. Um, so where did those come from? And I'll start there. Um, the compulsion to use the term whitewashing history is there, but I try to avoid it in this application because it's not how they thought about it in context and that's not excusing biased behavior. It's not, well, they were brown people so they couldn't have done it. It's, well, they weren't French so they couldn't have done it. I mean, you all know this. 
Um, but the cards that we see, the modern poker cards, are uh, what we call a French pattern. And there's a reason for that. The French pattern came around in about the middle of the 1400s. Not, it's hard to narrow it down to a decade because we don't have the earliest ones and we have some experiments. Um, we have the earliest documentation of people in France uh, particularly in the Lyons area where we believe this design came to be, uh, about the 1440s. And we don't see fragments appearing in this style until, say, the 1460s, maybe 1470s-ish kind of time period. So somewhere in there, uh, this, this pattern, we think, came to be. But even then, there's a time frame where we don't have this information. Um, so we do know how it came to be. And if you look at lines on a map, I can show you my map, but it's, it, it's kind of, I'll, I'll show it to you if y'all really want to see it, but Lyons is in like South um, Eastern France. And it's from a trade route perspective, about halfway between two different um, suit systems that were already established. And that would be Spanish suited playing cards and German suited playing cards. And the Spanish play with cards that uh, have the same suit signs as say a tarot deck. So sticks and swords and cups and coins. Um, this is one of my packs. Oh, by the way, it's a shameless plug. Um, if you want to take time to look at some of my particular recreations more carefully, of course, my recreations are attempted to be authentic. Uh, and if you want to study them a little more closely, this is my website. Um, this is heatherhallcardgallery.com. And yes, I sell them. And yes, I encourage you to buy them. And there's my, there's my sales plug. But more importantly, that is where, again, you can find, I try to take good pictures of these things so that we know what makes them distinct, et cetera, et cetera. Plus measurements are there, whether or not they had backs, um, things like that. So the Spanish, and, and that's my name for my pack, uh, the Spanish had these really stunning cards and they're playing with sticks and swords and cups and coins. And yes, there's, uh, th that, those are called muchachos. They're little naked dudes on, uh, these would be from the 1500s. And I like to think of Spanish cards as looking like they have Cheetos and party picks on them because they do not intersect unlike some related patterns, but I'll, I'll get there, I'll get there. Um, that's what the Spanish are playing with. Meanwhile, the Germans are playing with, and by the way, uh, if you're looking for persona, because that was kind of my, uh, that was kind of my motive was not how did they make playing cards. I, I'm not trying to recreate um, handmade paper, hand printing, et cetera, et cetera. No, 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 no. If I do that, you can hold it like it's a piece of glass or something. I want you people to play with these. Um, this pack, if you get this pack from me, um, these in fact represent playing cards that go back decades before. The pattern is much older than 1520. So say you got a 1470 persona, these will work for you. Um, my lines tend to be a little idealized. I want them readable. Uh, I tend not to use too much smearing, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what, oh, and by the way, uh, you all might recognize this gentleman here. Uh, my jokers, because jokers are anachronistic, my jokers are in fact uh, SCA folk. So that would be Ma uh, Baron Conrad, um, <laughs> because of course he's gonna be on my German card. Um, in German packs, often, but not always, aces are anachronistic. Um, so if you see a card that looks like, of course it hides on me, uh, like this in a German pack, this is not an ace, this is a 10. They call them banner 10s. And sometimes they have a little X on them somewhere that indicates that that is a 10. But they have um, leaves or gern. I, I don't speak German, I'm not claiming to correct me, uh, rot, so for red, green and red, um, 
acorns depending on your dialect they're either they're either acorns or beech nuts and then we have uh the suit of hawk bells and these two markets use the two different style of cards the spanish cards and the german cards and they're playing very very different games with them uh and already there are hundreds of playing card games being played around uh, and no, we don't know them all. We have a few. I'm going to drop a book recommendation. There is a shop in England called Gothic Green Oak. They do cater to the living history crowd. It leans a little Anglo-centric because, you know, they're in Britain, of course. But there are games in here that are not necessarily British. Uh, and I think they've compiled it now. Uh, and obviously this is a copy I keep in my shop, but there's like almost 50 games in here uh, that are period to SCA. And he does, I, I couldn't be bothered to recreate this book because this is correct as far as I'm concerned. They give you citations of uh, when the game is mentioned and as many rules as possible from the time period but not necessarily embellishing on them. So uh, as uh, Xavier will point out, um, uh, Bassetta is missing a rule. Uh, a gambling game must favor the house for it to be a proper gambling game or the house doesn't make any money. Um, and uh, I believe it was an MIT uh, group that, that examine the game and determine that there has to be a rule missing because otherwise it doesn't favor the house. But these games are in here and one of my absolute delights and one of my recommendations if you pick up um, a pack of cards from another culture, from, from another ancestry, uh, and you want to get accustomed to looking at them, uh, it's, it, and it's even still named the same thing, Go Fish. So uh, go get the, the it's a fabulous book. Since I'm dropping books, since I'm dropping books, this is another book I strongly recommend. Uh, when the Cloisters did their exhibit by um, the, the curator's name is Tim Husband. I signed my copy. Um, this is the book that he, he gave with it. It is chock full of full size, very good images of, oh, look, that's a pack of cards I did. Uh, a very beautiful, very high definition images of what was in the exhibit. Uh, these are cards, as you can see, that are relevant to our time period. Uh, again, the author's name is Tim Husband. Like, you know, he's somebody's husband. Um, these are both resources that uh, I, I, I have a couple other books that, you know, depending on how deep down this rabbit hole you want to get that I would advocate for, but those two books in particular, go get them. Um, so back to the pattern development, you have the German playing cards and you have uh, the Spanish playing cards and the Germans are playing guard, card games like say Carnoffel, which I understand means hernia. Um, Carnoffel is played with maybe no aces um not all packs of playing cards have 52 cards like ours do uh, or like a poker a poker pack does um because bottom line because pace of play having said that um certain numbers of cards fit better in a printing machine so i'm not quite sure which came first the chicken or the egg if it was um you know the shorter pack came first i'm presuming that the printers noticed that the gamers were editing out certain cards in the game and saying, oh, well, since we don't need to print those, we're not gonna print those, they fit better without it. So the German folk are, and there, there's a lovely little king um, and he's very indicative. He will be on a throne and have a crown. That is, the, that is your king. And uh, I have even seen women and naked women sitting on a throne with a crown. That means that card is a king. Um, so the Germans are playing card games that may or may not have aces. Maybe they cut out the twos and even the threes. Uh, if you've ever seen a modern scat pack, uh, you, will, you will see this omission. Meanwhile, the Spanish folk are playing with cards that uh, don't have tens. 
and back to the very earliest part. Do, do, do. This is my recreation of cards that are called Mariska. And they're called Mariska because of the style they're painted. They are finger painted. They may date to about 1400, they're plain back. Um, and they feature uh, knights. Uh, Latin suited cards will have a king, a knight, and a jack. Um, they are sticks and swords and club, uh, cups and coins. These are polo sticks, which is weird because it's not something that Europe had. Um, but uh, there's even no tens in this pack. They, it wasn't found with any tens. So the Spanish have been playing cards without tens for a long time. Um, so what does this have to do with France? Well, they're halfway between the two. And if I'm a card maker and I'm gonna present a theory that I'm not sure of, I'm just, I cannot exclude this possibility. Uh, I'm a card maker in the middle of the 1400s in Southern France uh, as a woman. And we know that women made cards because their names are on the lists. Uh, it's indoor work. And um, it, it, cur curiously enough, their names tend to be taken off of the cards. Uh, especially there's some Spanish packs that say the family name uh, over and over and over and over and over again, all over the cards. But, you know, if a woman made it, there's no sign of that at all. I would, why? We don't know. Uh, but at the same time this is happening, there are priests running around screaming bonfires of the vanities. This is a real thing where people are throwing their uh, their gaming systems, their backgammon boards, their dice, et cetera, et cetera, into bonfires uh, supposedly by the thousands. So there's every possibility that I have to grab my stuff and run. Well, if I print playing cards, that's a piece of pear wood. And they don't just cut down pear, pear trees for wood. You know, you cut down a pear tree for a reason. And uh, it has no cross fibers. And if they're cared for, they will last for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prints. Um, but it does get, uh, the, the older the wood gets, the sweeter it gets and the more appealing it gets to worms. So sometimes when the plates get really old, like when they find them in the 19th century, they're full of wormholes, which is really kind of sad, but you can still get a pull from them. Um, but here's the situation. A woman in Southern France, again, she's got these people that want playing cards and these people want playing cards. And these people don't play with tens. And these people don't play with aces. So they won't use each other's playing card packs. Um, and by the way, both of these systems, you, there's a xylograph, there's a black line drawing for every single card in the pack. And you see that guy, I'm gonna pull him up again, apparently. You see how there's a black line around him, no matter what. This is a, a number card and there's black lines around that. That's a xylograph. Um, so suddenly if I'm catering to both markets, I have plates and plates and plates and plates of wood. I didn't carve them. I paid an, a, uh, a guildsman to carve those. Um, and somebody comes in with bonfires of the vanities and I've got to run. Are you kidding? Um, so some brilliant person, and I've, I've made a miniature version of this so that y'all can see it. Some brilliant person took these German suits and realized that the Spanish are playing a game, uh, they play a game called ombre, that it doesn't use any tense, but it does gender a sign. So I don't think I need to tell you cups are a girl suit, clubs are a boy suit, swords are a boy suit, Oh, okay. Coins are a girl suit, right? Um, they would like kind of a binary pack. So there's those German cards. And then they simply colored them binary. Boy, girl, boy, girl. Now, what, what you say, what's with the caro? That's the French word for what uh, English, English colony speakers would call diamonds. Um, this is a much easier shape to cut with a knife. And, oh, and another thing, there's no stencil around the heart and the diamond because there's no xylograph. Um, I don't need to make one. I just need one plate. I need one xylograph with 12 
cards on it and everything else is just a stencil. So I could easily grab that stuff and run. It cost me less to invest in it in the first place. And because I have less wood investment and um, more flexibility with my budget, uh, French suited playing cards tend to have more colors on them. They tend to have say five or six colors, whereas the German or Spanish suits at the time might have three or maybe four. Um, so that is where our French suit signs come from. That is why we play with those cards. Oh, why, why we play with those cards? Well, um, where are they? Come here. No, 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 not that deck. As I fumble around. Um, there we go. Recognize this gentleman? This is our suicide king. And this is what he would have looked like to Queen Elizabeth. They're pretty close to that. Uh, notice he is not committing suicide. He is wielding an ax. He's a warrior and he's gonna kill somebody. And he is so old. How old is he? He is so old. I'm going back to that Spanish patch. Let's see if it, oh, there he is. He is a king of coins back in Spain, and he dates to probably a century before Queen Elizabeth ever saw the gentleman. Um, so he's been around a while. Uh, the card faces, the card courts tend to get passed around. So I am a card maker and I am retiring and I have two apprentices. Well, you get half of my plates and you get the other half of my plates. And that's how that changes up. And, um, or maybe I, maybe he died and I took a plate out of his house when he wasn't looking or something like that. There's all sorts of reasons we don't necessarily know, but we end up with something called patterns. And patterns are, as you see, this gentleman gets around, he is not proprietary to an individual card printer. In fact, he's been on a number of different patterns. Uh, a standard, is when the government gets involved and puts a tax stamp on that and says you're not printing or making playing cards and unless we give you that seal of approval uh, because the government takes a lot of <laughs> when king james put a six shilling tax stamp on the playing cards in like 1605 that's like can you imagine paying five dollars tax for that I mean, that's crazy. Uh, and the card makers in Britain said, wait, we, we're, we're gonna starve. We can't, we can't compete with, uh, we can't compete with the imports. And the king says, oh, don't, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll ban the imports. And he said, his people are at the port. He's making money hand over fist. And it took the French another century to figure out that their neighbors were doing this. The, the Spanish invented this idea. Uh, the the British noticed it, and then in 1701, the Span or the French finally got around to figuring this out. The uh, French originally approved nine different patterns. Some of them appeared to be for export only. Uh, that would be my Dauphin pack uh, on my on my uh, website. Um, Dauphin appears to have been exported from Lyon to uh, to Switzerland. Uh, whereas some packs remained in France, for example, the Paris pattern, which is what they use today. Hold on, let me see if I can find one of those for you. Do, do, oh, there we go. Air France, hey, because of course, um, this is what our modern cousins look like. Um, after a while, this gentleman named Napoleon came around and he said, you know, it's nice that we have our own national whatnot, but it, it's kind of inefficient to have nine patterns. We should narrow it down to one and it should feature me. So he made these beautiful like Romanesque, you know, like imagine uh, Greek columns and togas and whatnot uh, on these beautiful, beautiful playing cards. And no, I don't recreate them because that's not really my time period. Um, but after a while, the French got a little tired of that guy <laughs> and they went, you know what? He did have a point though. There's no point in reintroducing all these different patterns. That's unnecessary paperwork. So they just stuck with the, uh, the, um, the Paris pattern 
And this is, see, they look very, very similar, but they're a little bit, they're a little bit different. And there are, this pattern, by the way, is period. Uh, I haven't done a copy of it because someone else has. I wonder if I can find mine. Do, do. No, you don't, want to, you don't want to show your head. Uh, it's around here somewhere. Uh, there are there are period examples of that that is a historic pack, um, but when you go that far back, they won't have two heads; they will have feet. Um, that is, for most places, a nineteenth-century innovation. Although, uh, I believe um, I piled up stuff too much. Sorry. <laughs> oh, there you are. Um, I believe the first pack to have two heads is, uh, this is called a Bolognese tarot or a Bolognese tar tarakini because it's not 78 cards, it's less. You know how, like, like I said, they edit out number or they edit out cards. Well, uh, that's the lowest suited, or that's the lowest number. There are no fives, fours, threes, twos. Um, it's just not how they're made. And these are swords, you know, I know they look like swords, don't they? Notice that they intersect, they are elliptical. That's part of it. Uh, these are cups, um, page of cups, blah, blah, blah. Da, 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 da. The best, this would be a bastoni. Uh, the bastoni intersect like that. These are one of the first patterns to be very modernized. Um, but other parts of Italy, they still have their feet. They're still single-ended uh, rather than two-ended. So it kind of depends on where you are. Uh, for modern poker cards, uh, you're looking post-American Civil War. Uh, the same with rounded corners. That's kind of a post-Civil War thing. Uh, the same with these types of cards default coming with a back prior to that they're called plain backs and they just didn't they were just they were just playing uh and this is common uh again it depends on your region uh if you are uh in germany during period cards are going to have backs and they'll usually look something like these are kind of, I mean, they're my, my own, but this is kind of an idea of what German backs will look like. I'm gonna give you a, uh, another book suggestion. Whoops. Come here, guys. Uh, if you wanna go down the rabbit hole, this is a little tricky of a book to find. Um, it, it's, quite a, it's quite a big beastie. And as you can see, this is rather relevant to SEA time period. It is in German, it is, it's not translated, um, but oh, and the kitty is here. Uh, <laughs> um, but this is full of wonderful pictures of fragments of German playing cards. If you wanna go down the rabbit hole of German playing cards, this is great. Um, hi, buddy. Thanks. Thanks a lot, I'm busy. The time is okay. It's we got half hour. Excellent. Um, okay, so that's where French suits come from. Uh, so you've seen an example of what German suits, an example, and I should say that that's just an example. They used all kinds of different, depending, there are feathers and frogs and crowns and and bagpipes and leaves and flowers and different flowers and different flowers and clusters of grapes and all sorts of different types. Um, <laughs> all right, Job, come here. Uh, all sorts of different kinds of suits in German playing cards. Come on, bud, hey. Yep, come here. There you go. He's, he's a brick, I'll pick him up in a second. Oh. <laughs> um, He's also a little bit of a jerk. He's a sweet, no, he is a sweetheart, but if I don't give him the attention he demands, I get, I get nipped on the ankle. Uh, <laughs> see, somebody else said, oh, you need a cat cameo? Um, okay, how, how can I, does anyone wanna see anything in specific? Or do you just wanna see some fun examples of stuff that's appeared in history? I can, uh, then I'd love, thank you and, 
I'm happy to if y'all are here to stay. Um, I will show you examples as long as y'all want to see examples of playing cards. Yeah, examples are fine. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I made that one clear enough. This is as old of a pack as I can show you. I know what I can show you. Um, and frankly, uh, there's a facsimile available from the Fournier Museum. They are images of the fragments. The problem is they're just that, they're images of the fragments. They're not, uh, it's not a functional pack of cards. Anything that was missing is still missing. Uh, nobody used 600 year old pieces of paper to play with. Um, so that's why I like to, you know, it, that was one of my impetus is what, well, what did they look like when they were new? Um, and so now that is, uh, that's an ace of cups. And uh, it's a little weird looking. Uh, ooh, that's one of, these are my anachronistic jokers. So that uh, all, if you, if you get one of my, if you get your hands on one of my packs, they do come with jokers, unless there's a good reason for them not to. Uh, one or two of my packs don't. Um, again, oh, there's an ace of coins. He's got a little Italian hat on, um, but he's a, he's a Saracen. He's a Moor. He's got a, a Moor shield. Uh, once again, kings on a throne. There's a throne there somewhere, right? And he has a crown. Then you know that's the king. The French kind of make their king stand up, but he's still got a crown on. Um, these are coins. Uh, I think this, this pack is delightfully easy to read. Hey, Chubb, come here. Uh, and, and no queens, they have knights instead. Uh, and by the way, he's wearing a German hoopalon. So where the heck did this pack come from? It may have been printed in Ulm uh, or anywhere between there and Seville. It was found in Seville uh, in the, jerk. <laughs> it was found in the, the board, they're knocking down a house and they found it in the, in the boards. Uh, and it's, it's missing a hand. And so it's wondered if, you know, perhaps they weren't supposed to be doing it and they got interrupted and, uh, you know, that hand got hidden. It, it's hard to say. The nice thing about it is it's one that was found, um, the, the, the pack of cards was found in the field. Usually they find sheets. Uh, you know, the, the, the card maker was printing something, the sheet didn't come out right for some reason. So he threw it in the recycling bin and it got recycled into a book binding. And centuries later, they're up doing the book binding and they go, oh, oh, look at these. And, uh, and that's how a lot of fragments survive. So we're missing a couple cards. We're missing a color or two or three. And that's where I like to come in. I specifically like to do cards that... Um, are missing parts and not likely to get recreated otherwise. But I do get asked about some specific examples. So I, I brought those all out so I can show them off. Um, everybody's familiar with this one, right? Um, they're beautiful. This pack came from uh, the Cloisters exhibit, just like the other book did. Uh, it's printed by Piatnik. It comes with a lovely little booklet about it. Uh, it's, it's in fact quite informative for the, being a little book. Um, these cards are the correct size. Uh, they are beautiful. And people say to me, Heather, why don't you re recreate these? And I say, well, there's a couple of reasons I recreate those. Quick, what's this card? I don't know either. Um, they're not they're not easy to read. You would have to get used to them. Uh, they are, and, and that's when it turns into they were specifically commissioned as a gift from a rich client to his rich friend. These are one percenter toys. And the whole reason this pack survives in the first place is because it was tucked into a curio cabinet and never touched. Um, so most people never saw or handled things like this. Uh, another reason I don't create them is that many SCA folk have taken this up as an illumination project. I don't want to wrestle with people. I want to let their, their work shine. Uh, let those people do those things because they do. I've seen some beautiful refabrications of this pack. Um, this is not easy or cheap to do. 
I, uh, I am not working right now because I have carpal tunnel and tendonitis and I need injections and I haven't done it because I'm stressed and don't want to see people and I don't need to tell you about pandemics and things. Um, know if you acquire this pack, if you find them, um, it's a marked deck because every correct back with the museum number on it is there. So this is a beautiful simile, but it's not the best for gaming, if that makes any sense. Uh, if you do succeed in using it for gaming, tell me about it. But um, it, I, I, that's why I haven't done it and why I don't necessarily advocate. I hope that, I hope that makes any sense. Um, having said that, here's, here's another favorite uh, uh, simile example. This is a neat example. This was at the Cloisters exhibit. Um, these are again about correct size. Once again, comes with a nice little booklet. You're not gonna find these for $20 on the internet. I'm sorry, you're not. Um, the suits in this pack are uh, the heraldry from different regions. And they feature people with ordinary jobs. There is a quite a famous one uh, of a woman who's at her potter's wheel. Uh, you'll recognize this guy on the cover of the, the other book. Uh, and he was at the exhibit. He is gorgeous. Oh my gosh, the, the gold on them still pops, uh, which once again means these cards were tucked away and not played with. Um, but one of the things that I noticed about these cards is there is a xylograph and they're hand painted. Uh, early part of the 1400s. Um, so what we have here is a compromise because we also have, <clears throat> there are a couple of Visconti Tarot's. Once again, they survive because somebody is determined to get your, I just see this tail going back. <laughs> um, they may not read well on, um, on camera, I don't know. These are, once again, they try to make them very similar in size to the real ones. Uh, these are all hand illuminated. They would have cost them what they would have cost today, which means you're going to pay an artist to spend a year on your project or something, or months and months and months. And um, so we even have receipts of the time. Oh, and by the way, these would have been plain backs. Uh, we have receipts from the time where uh, the, the well-to-do, or at least the well-to-do enough to have, um, to, that, that could afford a, a hand illuminated pack of Taraki. Um, he's, he's grumbling. I can hear the cat like any time. Uh, hey, Heather. The, <laughs> yes. The last ones that you were showing, those have to me, like what I'm seeing through the camera looks like they have a gloss to them. They're very glossy. Are they here? Let me grab. Uh, let me grab their brothers. Would that have been the case, or is that just you know the modern way they printed them? Um, if any of you have a hand illuminated award, it wouldn't look too different from that. They would not have been shiny. Okay. Um, this is a, that's that pack is not painted on. Um, well, they may not look glossy to you. I was, that's kind of what I was asking. Well, they they Are did they on glossy? camera, though, didn't they? Yeah, they did this to me. Another Visconti. Yeah. And again, I can see that reflection. Uh, they should not be quite so shiny. This would have been, this is gilded in gold. Um, so they would have, they were a little, um, you know, I mean, there's 500 years of, of, of. Well, but the gilding would have definitely been reflective and had some, you know, some, some of that quality to it. Definitely. And the Hof Hamptish spiel cards were very, were shiny. The um, particularly where the gold is, not where the paint is, but where the gold is, they were shiny. Um, these were not quite as shiny, but uh, they they're definitely it's it's definitely the, the 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 proper metal because it's it it had a certain amount of natural gloss to it. Like I said, the uh, the the paints uh, were are five hundred year old paints and matte and so on and so forth, but. This is buying a Lamborghini, guys. This is this is showing off to your friends, and at the same time, they would buy a cheap pack, which would cost what they 
a couple of dollars like they do today. Um, there we go. So if at the same time you bought cards that look like this, you might also buy cards that look like these. Um, these are block printed. Yes, these are mine. Um, and they're again, sticks and swords and cups and coins. Uh, if you've ever seen a Marseille, they look a little like a Marseille in that they have, uh, they don't have unique cards for every single numbered card. That's a more modern thing. Uh, notice again, the, those are batons or bastoni. Uh, that's an, they're, they intersect. That's an ace of bastoni. Uh, that's an ace of coins. That's a king of coins. Notice he's got his legs covered uh, because he's holding a feminine suit. Whereas, let's see, do, 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 let's find one of the boy suits. Um, there we go. Uh, the king of swords has his legs exposed and the queen of swords has armor on. Uh, there is a masculinity, femininity thing going on in a lot of these cards, but these would have been pennies in comparison. And these were used until they wore out. Um, absolutely. That's, and that's why they're less likely to survive. Uh, I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, my friend Marco makes this one, which is just another interpretation of the same fragment. The fragment in question is called the Rosenwald. Uh, it is housed at the National Gallery. It is not on display, much to my, uh, much to my disappointment. But that uh, masculinity, femininity thing with the, uh, with the Latin suits. Here's another uh, pack that I recreated. Um, it was my intent to recreate a Taraki, a Taro. Um, and when I looked at the fragments and where they were cut and where they weren't cut and so on and so forth, I ended up putting together a deck of cards instead. Uh, they were printed in uh, Venice. The fragments are now housed in Budapest. Um, the layout of the cards is very indicative of Mariska cards, which I should really tell you about Mariska cards at some point. So that that's coins. Um, these are the swords. Notice how they're the opposite of elliptical this time. They're kind of squished together and wrapped around. Um, the layout of the copas, they're, they're kind of weird looking cups, but I swear they're cups. Um, and, uh, oh, and this is really far out. They're indexed, or at least kind of indexed. Uh, these would be bastoni or batons. And notice there is an index, yes, it is in Italian, in the middle of the card. And this is the only suit that has indices. Um, and it's, it's just that way. Um, and oh, and the fragments, they're even backwards as if they were cheaply copied and not thought about, who knows. But what's neat about this pack, Come on, fellas, show me. Here's our King of Swords. Once again, notice the armor notice. He is a manly man. Um, and swords are a boy suit. This is the King of Cups. What? Yeah, that's a king. Um, uh, so, <laughs> um, I, 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 I believe the pronouns are he. Uh, it, it does, obviously, that doesn't even matter. When this card is in play, this is a king. That's what matters. Um, and this pack also has, remember uh, Italian cards have a knight card instead of a queen card. So this is the knight of cups and he's riding a what? I think that's a peacock. <laughs> it's a little crazy. Here's the Jack in that same suit. Uh, and again, a feminine, a feminine card. Whereas uh, all of the other court cards are and again, he's on his throne. And check out, check out this knight. Is he far out? And this is the jack of clubs. And he's a wild man. And he's not the only wild man that appears in playing cards. Um, those are not that unusual. Uh, they've appeared a couple of times. Um, but I mentioned the Mariska cards. So, you know, I've, I've gone around about what, you know, Europeans have been doing with playing cards. Well, where the heck did they get them? Um, 
they got them from the caliphate. And I can show you two replicas. <laughs> the black box was made the year I was born. And there are like 750 of these. Uh, it is one theoretical recreation. They are lovely. They are photographic, unless they are recreated. I have pretty bags like that. Um, they are, again, sticks and swords. Oops, they're upside down. They're sticks and swords and cups and coins, little booklet. Uh, those would be swords or scimitar. Uh, scimitars, come on, guys. Be adventurous with that, would you? Um, those are tumen. Once again, they wouldn't be this glossy. Uh, tumen is not a word for cups, even though that's obviously what these are. Tumen means myriads. I'll get back to that too. Um, those are polo sticks, like the finger painted ones were polo sticks. Uh, and of course there's coins. Um, that is the older and harder to find pack, but oh, good news for you. There is a modern reproduction with different, you wanna look for this one. Hold on, you all requested a cameo. Come here. This is Mello. He is a beast. <laughs> he is a beast. Hold on, I'll give him a little kibble. There you go, buddy. So, uh, Chez's Mamluk pack, once again, nice little booklet. Uh, they're a little smaller than the other ones. Uh, and it's my observation that the Mamluk packs, if you were to fold them in half, which I'm not doing, but if you were to fold them in half, this is the size you would get. So these are, if you put two of these together, they're the same size as the Mamluk cards. Interesting. Um, so there might be a relation there. Now, my one friend in Colorado, uh, if you are in uh, the Outlands, seek the out gesture. He is extremely researched in playing cards um, and he knows the things. And he found out that um, he's been looking into the, uh, the Mamluks use these little paper booklets. And it's like they just drew them out by hand and in the booklets and you know, in thin paper, maybe glued them together. Uh, but sometimes their backs are pink, which is what this booklet paper was made of. Um, but he, and he's got, the Trez's Mamluk has rounded edges. So you can use this like a modern pack of cards. Gorgeous backs, oh my goodness. Um, and he has produced hypothetical cards. He's also got a little bit of a marking system. You notice that some of them have uh, a different border on them than others. That is, and in the booklet it explains because some of them are recreated. Some of them are from fragment pack number one in the top copy museum. Some of them are from fragment pack number two in the top copy museum. And then there is even a third fragment pack. And it's just, you know, how many cards we have from each pack. So some of these he recreated more than once. Um, it's a beautiful uh, pack and it, it, these are great. But this is what is thought to have come into Europe. Um, this, these fragments that this is recreated from date to about 1500. So the skeptic says, yeah, but these could have come from European playing cards. How do you know? Well, they found a fragment that's much, much, much older, and it's like a quarter of a four or an eight of cups, and that's it. And it was found in other stuff, and it dates 12th or 13th century. I'm blanking on it. I'm so sorry. But it way outdates any European cards that survive. Um, and is into the land of plausible for a Viking persona. So maybe someday I'll get around to that. Um, but where the heck did the caliphate get them? Well, um, the thinking is that back in, I want to say, was it the ninth century? Uh, they were at war with what we now call Uzbekistan. 
and there's a village where they uh, in Uzbekistan and to this day they still make paper in that town because the Chinese lost to the caliphate and the prisoners taught them paper making. Uh, there was other types of paper making elsewhere in the caliphate but it wasn't really cool for some reason but at this point it appears to have taken off and at that point the Chinese also were documenting that they were playing a game called leaves and we have two systems called leaves and one of them looks similar to what you know there are four suits with uh one to ten or one to nine or something similar to that uh and then a couple of court cards um a mahjong set descends from these for example now a mahjong pack or a mahjong set like a tarot one of those suits has been kind of substituted with uh, a weird suit but they do descend from the same system now there's another system in china and it appears to be even older than that. Probably the easiest way for me to show you that is look for these kinds of cards. Um, the Chinese word is pi. Pi means tile uh, or plaque. And uh, it does not necessarily refer to it being made of paper or not. These are Chinese dominoes. And they have the exact same markings on them as those cards do. And what the heck do those cards, or what the heck do those markings mean? They're all of the possible rolls of two ordinary D6 dice. So the thinking is that dice games, it, they were playing a game that involved a tally and they started collecting and swapping the tallies. And at some point the game became all about swapping your tallies and the dice part was just dropped. So that is a thought about where they came from. Uh, there is another argument because uh, in Korea, they played a game called Tujon. I have made a replica of Tujon, but um, I've not figured out how to make it marketable. Um, they would have had like little arrow fletchings on their back or little wings on the back. And then they would have had, uh, Hangul is late period. Uh, but they you know, would have had Chinese markings on them and they kind of like crisscrossed them. I don't fully understand the play, uh, but these are really interesting playing cards and they're thought to have descended from divination systems involving arrows. So now we're really entering into the muddy of where did they really come from? And uh, the honest scholar says, we don't really know. Um, but that would be the gist of where playing cards come from and why we have French suits. Um, there are obviously other countries have rich and interesting histories of producing cards, but those suit systems are, the, the suit system is named after where the oldest fragments come from. It's not necessarily where they were created. It's not necessarily where they stay but um, Italian suits come from Italy. Uh, like I said, think of those elliptical swords. Um, modern, uh, modern Spanish suits or Southern Italian cards because Southern Italy was controlled by Spain for a long time where you have swords uh, and things that uh, do not intersect. Uh, by the way, there is one living descendant other than my own cards is one living descendant of those Mariska, those finger painted cards. Uh, and that would be uh, the Sicilian Taraki. It is rather small for a tarot. It is a gaming tarot. Again, uh, the, the esoteric tarot came around uh, about the same time as the American Civil War. Um, intersecting clubs, intersecting swords, and they're straight. There's no ellipses. Um, whoop, they have a really, really creepy card called Misery. And there's no, there's no devil. There is a ship. Their tower is a Martello tower. Uh, let's see if I can find out. Oh, their hanged man is not hanging by his feet. He's, okay, I'm done now. He's creepy. Uh, <laughs> Um, 
Uh, I, it, I've got a couple minutes and again, y'all can hang around as long as you would like to. Um, we're, we're both packs made in Italy. Um, it, uh, <laughs> tell me again, which packs, I'm sorry, I was babbling. Yeah, there's a lot of small deck choices. Um, German cards tend to have small packs. Um, German cards are like I, said, I mean here uh, for for so that's the whole reason I brought out a modern poker pack. Um, this is these are modern poker size, uh, and this is that German size that I have. They're not very big. Um, I have Portuguese cards, which are not very big. Um, do, oh, uh, I'll leave it. I didn't even pull these out. The Portuguese went over to J uh, Japan, as you all know, and the Portuguese had packs like the Span uh, like the Sicilian Tarot, where there's the straight intersection, or like the uh, uh, like the finger painted pack. So the Japanese, and this card right here is the only one they found that survived, which is how I have anything that resembles a color palette. Uh, when the band hammer comes down in Japan, it comes down hard. So they got rid of all of it, but somebody found the plate or the plates and turned them into a bento box. And the bento box survives and there's beautiful high def images of it online. So I was able to figure out what the xylograph looked like. Oh, look, aces have dragons on them. So does the Portuguese pack. Oh, if, if I don't find it, look at my website. Um, they turn the flowers upside down. Um, and oh, here's absolutely the best part. Let's see if I can, there's another ace. Um, see if I can find one of those. The, um, the Jack cards are all female on this. And two of them are slaying dragons. Is that not cool? And the, the Portuguese pack is the same way. Um, some, some of these cards are really neat. Uh, and there's a lot of the, the pack I'm working on reproducing right now is um, uh, features uh, <clears throat> burlesque elements. And I've included that in a couple of my packs already. Uh, burlesque elements often means boobs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that happens. Um, this is a pack found, found in Liechtenstein. It's weird because it's sticks and swords and cups and coins. And it has a fifth suit of Shilton or shields. And uh, which is a very Swiss, the, the, the Swiss have, um, the Swiss have shields and flowers and acorns and bells. And they play a game called Jass, but Jass is a common or a, a, a post period game. Uh, but this pack has some burlesque elements. Let's see if I can find it. This is a weird pack. Um, it could date to the time period of the garments. It could, but it might date to a late period um, antiquarian group. And so either way it's period, but it's, uh, oh, and this is a pack that will have banner tens. Doo -doo. Come on, where's, um... I, I, I absolutely adore this guy, but there's a, there's a couple of burlesque cards in here. There's um, suit of shields. Usually when you see the suit of shields, uh, you see them have no color at all. I colored them because I wanted to. Uh, there is an ober. They, the, they don't use a queen or a jack. They use a king. An ober who hold, who is the suit is up here and an unter whose suit is down here. Uh, and there's an unter and oh, look, another woman. Yay. They don't have to. Here's a burlesque card. Ahem. Here's an, oop, come here, you jumping out of my hands there's another one Woo! um so yeah they had a, there's there's lots of fun uh fragments and once again for anyone who came in late go to my website it's heather hard heather hall card and there there are lots of pictures i've done about two dozen packs already uh, I've done more, I just don't necessarily sell them all, so they're not necessarily on my website, but there's a lot of images 
uh, if you want to get a closer look and a little more description about what packs were available in what areas, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, uh, it's, it's about time. And he said that there's uh, nobody else taking up this room. So if you guys want to see anything, um, here, oh, I can think of some fun things to show off. I'm going to go ahead and put the link to the Google Drive that's got all the class handouts. Yours is in there so that anybody that uh, didn't get that before can get it now. Thank you. This is, um, uh, I, I've seen examples in museums. Your cards may have been carried like this if you were willing to pay for such a case. Um, after all, the printer made books. So he would know how you could find a book binding. Um, this one comes from Germany. These are German cards uh, from the 20th century. And I know that, because, come on kids. Uh, and oh, 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 these are gilded edge. Look at that, ooh, ah, oh, very pretty. Um, this is a tax stamp. And the neat thing about this card is that there should be a number right there indicating how much, how much you paid in taxes. The reason there is no number there is because this is during the 1920s in Germany. Inflation was so bad that it might change in an afternoon. So they just stopped putting it on the card um, and replaced it with different things eventually. Uh, but that's an example of what a tax stamp looks like. After a while, Americans started putting them on um, Nowadays, bicycle uses this as a, you know, a quality seal. But in the 20th century, if you bought it, if you bought cards with a tax stamp up until the 1960s, uh, that tax stamp would have been here. Uh, that is, however, why the Ace of Spades is so ornate. When King James put the tax stamp on the cards, just out of period, uh, it was a stamp put on by an official, um, which was easy to fake. And, uh, oh, if they do, you do not want to get caught faking it because that will cost you uh, your head. Uh, they will remove it permanently from your body. Um, uh, but the, and after a while, it, once again, about the American Civil War era, um, the, you bought the ace of spades from the government uh, rather than them taking the risk of letting the stamp out of the house. But they would only approve of the one pattern. And those are the ones that we now see as a, a poker pack. Um, and the reason for the distortion is because when the government comes in and starts taxing the heck out of everything, and you've just lost your profit margin, uh, what's the first thing to go? The talent. So now you have people that don't necessarily have the same education in carving skills. And then they start widening the cards to meet for different printing standards. And the nuances of the cards just disappeared. Uh, but the beautiful thing is, is that when you, if you wanna see the most beautiful cards that were really produced, you, you gotta go to the 1500s. Um, they made the best paper. They took the time to, you know, all these little details. And if you, if you go, um, there's another, um, I, I would call this person a fellow facilitator, uh, McGregor Games. Uh, my cardstock lasts a little longer if you're going to play with them, but he sells ones that are images of plates that were printing then. And he has a couple that are, um, metal engraved plates from Germany. And once again, you may have to play around or two of Go Fish to get used to them. They do not have 52 cards necessarily because I think the one of them does, but they don't necessarily because that's not the card games that they were playing with them. Um, but they are gorgeous engravings with gorgeous garment details and you know details about life. The one of them is, has bookmaker suit signs, like, you know, the, um, uh, the ink dauber, for example, that you would uh, use to, to put ink on the plate is one of the suit signs. It's, it's just wild. Um, so I recommend hunting these down. Uh, like I said, they're not, they're, they're, uh, he can also substantially undercut my, uh, my cost. So he, can, he offers them a much better price. Uh, but if you're going to game with them, uh, I will say that my, my card stock is a little tougher. Um, 
Oh gosh, what else can I, I, I have so many things here. What can I show you? Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Anyone wanna see anything in particular? Um, let's, okay. Um, it, it, thank you. I, I wanna say thank you all for attending. I hope that was informative. Um, give you an idea of what was and was not available. Thank you so much for coming.